Hello everyone, Gino Barbaro here, one of the co-hosts of the Wheelbarrow Profits podcast, and my co-host today, Josh Rusin, my bro. How you doing, Josh? Gino, doing well. Excited to be on this podcast with you here today. How are you doing? I'm doing good. We've got a great guest today, but before we get to the guest, what are we doing in October, Josh? No, we, we actually have our second live event. Gino, tell them a little bit about it. Well, the first one went off really well last year in, in Knoxville. We decided to bring this one October 6th and 7th to Nashville. Nashville's a happening city. It's going to be a great place at the Renaissance Hotel. We're looking to get 350 people there. Tickets are going fast, guys. The hotels are ramping up. It's going to be a great weekend down there. Uh, we're going to have our whole team down, buy right, manage right, and finance right. And we're looking to have a really awesome time. So um, anything else to add, Josh? Yeah, I think really what those that attend this event are going to learn are really how to explode their wealth, create passive income, and become financially free by investing in mom and pop apartments. And you're going to actually learn the strategies that we use in today's market to teach you how to move into the space and accomplish your goals. I think more importantly, we're going to have all our team members there. We're going to have our vendors there. We're going to have some amazing speakers there. Um, it's all about multifamily. Um, that's what we focus on. That's where we think we, we want to teach people to create wealth. And not only wealth, but just generational wealth and, and getting financially free. So I uh, hope you guys can make it. It's October 6th and 7th. If you have any questions, you want to sign in or register, hit up my boy Josh here at josh at jakeandgino.com. And love to see you there. Um, today's guest, awesome guest today. Dave Van Horn. Since 2007, Dave has served as president and CEO of PPR No Company, a holding company that manages several funds that buy, sell, and hold commercial mortgages nationwide. His expertise is derived from over 30 years of residential and commercial real estate experience as a licensed realtor, real estate investor, and fundraiser. As the latter, Dave has raised over 100 million bucks for both notes and commercial real estate. He also cons owns a considerable portfolio of residential investment properties, as well as various commercial holdings. Without further ado, Mr. Van Horn, how are we doing? Good day, gentlemen. How are you guys doing? We're doing good. Let's dive into your story. 30 years. I got a lot of stuff there. Notes, residential, commercial. How did you get into the business? By accident, like everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, well, I got out of, I went to college at first to be an accountant, and I switched to business management and got out of school and couldn't get a job, so you can relate to that. <laughs> and I was working in construction, and I was all depressed. <laughs> and and um, I, my mom actually said, why don't you go to uh, become a realtor? So I became a realtor at like age 26, and then I started getting into investing in uh, properties. Um, the, the funny part is I started buying houses with credit cards, which is a whole story in itself. And uh, I would refinance them and get basically infinite rates of return and build a whole portfolio, you know, a decent sized portfolio like that. So I, uh, you know, I just kept moving up and moving up and uh, became a realtor, owned a title company, eventually became a property manager. Uh, got hurt and got out of the contracting business. My oldest son actually still runs that company. Uh, so, you know, a lot of things happened over the years. Uh, so it, I drifted into commercial at first and I uh, was doing mobile home parks, storage centers. And um, I originally started raising capital for a company uh, out of New Jersey that was buying mobile home parks in the Midwest and in Pennsylvania. Uh, we were doing storage centers and mobile home parks. We did some in Indiana. Uh, so it was a, I, I learned how to raise money, raising money for someone else at first. Mm -hmm. And then they had a bigger purpose than themselves too. They were actually doing it all for, a, they were building a Christian Academy and they were doing uh, all, a lot of the proceeds were coming from the, you know, the investments to help pay to build the school, maintain mm -hmm. the school and that kind of thing. So, um, I was just, you know, helping them raise capital in the very beginning. And I also had a pool of investors. And it started because I ran a real estate investor meeting, almost like a meetup would be today. Mm -hmm. um, and like-minded investors came there and we were just regular, you know, real estate guys sharing our network, sharing our deals, that type of thing, financing each other out of our retirement accounts and things like that. And then what would happen because I was running the group, I would interview speakers or investment opportunities. And then that's kind of how I got working for those folks. And then, you know, the ability to raise capital led me to, you know, right before the downturn, uh, one of the speakers actually at our group was someone out of Manhattan raising capital for distressed mortgages. And of course, I didn't do anything for like three years. Uh, but my one partner, John, did. And, uh, you know, next thing you know, uh, right before the crash, you know, I went from, I was a REMAX agent selling like 75 houses a year to investors 
uh, or, you know, apartments and things like that. But what ended up happening was I went down to like five. There was no financing for investors, right? Mm -hmm. So real estate's a finance driven business. I was like, well, what am I, which side of the fence do I want to be on? So we got into the distressed debt space, uh, primarily in junior liens, which looking back, some people look at as kind of crazy. Um, but then, you know, it grew and grew and grew. And we started out as a couple investors, literally buying four loans. Um, today, we own thousands and probably over 8,000 mortgages today. Um, you know, we manage well over 100 million in assets. So it's grown from this club <clears throat> to a little bit of a business. Now it's more like an enduring enterprise. Um, I have 30 employees and we do outsource a lot of stuff too. Wow, that's awesome. So let's go back to your first house that you, that you bought or sold. Tell me about that experience at 26 years old. You know, it's funny. I bought my first property in 1989 and it was a, a duplex. I bought it FHA and uh, I still own it. You know, that's the crazy part. I cash flow wow. out the wazoo. I probably refinanced it like five times. <laughs> the, uh, I ended up, I had a lot behind it that was attached to it. I actually built commercial garages behind the duplex. And I lived there for the first few years. You know, we have, you know I was married and I had, uh, eventually I had one son and then uh, we moved out of there. But the, uh, the beauty of that is I think the lesson there is, well, utilize an FHA loan because if you cash flow after an FHA loan with just 3% down, that's pretty good yield, guys. And it's cheap financing. Um, and then what ends up happening is people get stuck on what they pay for a property. I paid almost re retail other than I made a commission on it. But, you know, looking back, who cares? I got in the game. Um, and you know, that place went up in value, like it's worth five, six times what I paid for it. It's mm -hmm. probably six times more than what I paid for it. So it's don't lose sleep over, Oh, can you believe I bought this multi unit, you know, for retail almost. I, I don't know that I would lose a ton of sleep over that because time flies, man. <laughs> mm -hmm. Next thing you know, you're an old guy like me, right? Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you, most people get into the business uh, against other people's wishes with you. It seemed like your mom pushed you to the business. Did that help you get into the business or did that, did that, you know, how did that feel for you? Um, you, you know, I, I don't, I, to this day, I don't think she really understands. Um, she thinks, um, you know, I made more money as a contractor than a realtor, which mom would always tell her friends I was the realtor, right? Like uh -huh. you know, moms are moms are like, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> But the, I think the reality of it was, um, yeah, I mean, I owe her a lot for that because that push got me into it. And not every realtor is into investment real estate either. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I was fortunate enough. I had, a, I had taken an, a real estate investment class towards my brokers uh, and, and the teachers. Like he, he basically said, how many people are uh, investing in real estate? And, you know, he literally threw the textbook in the trash can and we were like, you know, he was buckling down with us to, Hey guys, you need to get, you have no retirement as a realtor, right? You need, mm -hmm. you need to own property. So, uh, it was a great lesson for me. And I, you know, I became financially free at, at about age 40, 42. And uh, it was a good thing because I got hurt and had to get out of the contracting business. And if it wasn't for the fact that I had owned, you know, at one point I had 40 prop, you know, 40 places. So those properties got me through that storm, you mm -hmm. know, and then, you know, one thing led to another. I still own quite a few properties. What would you have done differently when you started out? I would have probably thought bigger and leveraged more. So here's a classic example of that. You know, I was this Remax agent selling only to investors. And it, the cool part was I would sell you a property, Gino, right? And you might buy five or 10 from me a year. And the cool part about that is I would get the title. I would get the property management. And I owned a, a painting company. We might come in and paint your place. Right. You see what I'm doing? I'm getting paid four and five times for one deal, right? It's mm -hmm. like multiple streams of income from yes. you know, Robert Allen type thing, right? So that was the one thing. But I think the thing I would have, looking back, I was like, Dave, you had all the pieces to the puzzle. You just never connected the dots. I had the private money and the hard money and the property management. I could have bought all 75 houses myself. And you know what made me realize that I have a good buddy out of Memphis. He owns like 1,500 houses. And I'm like, how did he get there? And I'm thinking... I could have done that. Mm -hmm. what, what was I thinking? I was, th you know what it was? I was thinking about commissions. I wasn't thinking about, like you said, building wealth at the beginning of the podcast. I'm like, what did I miss there? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I, I should have thought bigger. And sometimes, sometimes we're afraid of success too. You know, we're afraid of thinking bigger. Um, well, at least I am sometimes. Wow. I'm going to go off for a minute or two here because there's a lot to unpack. First of all, transactions pay the bills. 
Equity gets you rich, guys. And it's hard when you're struggling and you're not financially free, but as soon as David became financially free, all of a sudden the floodgates open. That's just the reality. I don't explain, I can't explain it to you because I got financially free a couple of years ago and all of a sudden the opportunities are boundless. I'm able to focus on creating a business. Creating a business and an investment are two different things. Dave, I know Jake is out there somewhere listening. Dave is talking about multifaceted real estate. We have multifaceted multifamily where you have mo real multiple streams of income where he's the painter. He could be the floor guy. He could be the realtor. He could be the mortgage broker. He could be the title company. If he opens up a home insurance and auto life insurance on top of that, he really has multiple streams of income from that one little asset. All of a sudden, he's got five and six on top of that. He's creating a, a, a real viable business. He's vertically integrated his companies. And that's how you create wealth is when you can create and control all those different businesses and put them together. We've stumbled upon it. We have 900 units now. And all of a sudden, we have the property management. We have the syndication arm we're starting. We have the education. Dave, if you had put the education on top of that, um, I mean, you have the, I mean, it's just amazing what you can do. So um, you had seen it. Would you, I mean, it sounds, seems as if you're going that way now anyway, because you've got the education now, you've got multiple companies. So it seems like what you learned in the past, you're adopting to it now, correct? Yeah, I mean, we, we did the same thing in the note space. We uh, didn't have much of a market to sell reperforming upside down second mortgages with no equity. So we created education programs and we actually created a warranty. And that was enabled us to sell because we would buy back the asset if it redefaulted, right? Mm -hmm. So there's ways to create marketing or do things that, you know, the cool part about notes, I think the one reason I went into the note space was, Hey, we're all about getting property at a discount. Right. Mm -hmm. And we're also, so what I, you know, I, I was fortunate enough in college to have courses like money and banking and things like that. And I never connected the dots in college. I, you know, I took the course cause a hippie was teaching it. Right. So I was like, yeah, this is cool. Uh, but, but at the end of the day, I learned a lot and didn't realize what I learned. And, the idea of being the bank and using other people's capital, the sky's the limit, right? So when I started raising capital for other folks, I was like, that was one of my biggest mistakes. I know um, looking back, my big mistake was when I gave up control. So I was raising money for someone else. And I was mm -hmm. like, well, that's crazy. Why aren't I raising money for myself, right? And then now I'm in control. Um, you know, because some of those uh, things went under or went sideways. I'm like, well, yeah, I wasn't in control. I couldn't do anything about it. So now it's a different ball game with like my note company. You know, I'm the CEO. I am in control. I am raising the capital. Um, and what, the sky's the limit because it's like I'm my own bank, basically. And we're, we can all be our own bank. Each property you own is a bank. Each life insurance policy is a bank. Each IRA uh, is a bank. Mm -hmm. You know, we just need to switch our mode of thinking sometimes as to, you know, the financings, uh, the deals in the financing sometimes. And I found that with mobile home parks, for example, we bought, I guess four parks were bought with owner financing, hundred mm -hmm. percent. Uh, we always had even mobile home parks that had uh, traditional financing. Uh, we had a second mortgages held by every owner and you see that it's very common in commercial, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of times the deal is in this financing um, or refinancing, taking out investors, those types of things. So I think it's something that you got to be aware of, but the note space by being able to um, buy assets at a discount and you're ahead of everybody, right? I'm ahead of the sheriff's sale. I'm ahead of the, we buy houses guys, uh, nothing against those things. I've done those things, mm -hmm. right? So it's, but I, I just kind of found my way into, hey, let's cut to the chase. Let's, mm -hmm. let's go to the top if I can. And I think it's just been, yeah, we've been blessed, right? We've been able to raise you know, plenty of capital to go to market, buy product ahead of everybody. And then now you're just trying to add value to the value chain uh, before you exit your deals and you know, leave meat on the bone or whatever that is for the end users. Whether, you know, our strategy is quite simple. It's uh, a loan modification or uh, an REO. That's really, mm -hmm. it's not a fancy model that I can present to you. you know? mm -hmm. So let me ask you, what was, that, what was that point in your life when you realized that you had to start doing it for yourself? Because there comes a point in your life where you have that shift and say, okay, now is time to quit. I got to get over my fear and I just got to do it. Do you remember that point in your time? your life? It, it's actually happened a couple times. The first real time was when I worked in, a, it, I worked in construction. I was, I worked for a company for 13 years, you know, working for the man. Right. Mm -hmm. And you know, I had the, the retirement and the bennies and the, 
And, you know, it's hard to leave that 13 year job and go, oh, I'm going to start my own company. Mm -hmm. So I did that when I was 32. Um, and it takes, it takes guts to do that. You know, my wife thought I was crazy. My in-laws thought I was crazy, right? I started my own company. And the same way with real estate. When I told my in-laws I was buying properties with a credit card, my father-in-law <laughs> looked at me like I was nuts, you know? And even my first property had like 30 broken windows in it. And he's like, you're not going to let my daughter live in there, are you? <laughs> and I'm like, uh, do you want her to move back in with you? <laughs> and he's like, next thing you know, he's over there helping me renovate it. He's putting the kitchen floor in. So, uh, you know, it's the, all those kinds of things. But I think you're right. That that was the first time. And then I think uh, the second time that was a big time was when I realized I'm going to start raising significant capital for myself uh, to go do, uh, you know, pools of mortgages. And it really, in the beginning, I used our own money. Me and my partners used our money. We made sure it worked. And then we went out and raised people's money. So I always treated everyone's capital because they were all friends and family in the beginning. You know, I treated it like it was my own money. Um, you know, these are people that work really hard for their retirement money or whatever, and I wasn't going to squander that, you know, if, if there was any way I could help that, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm very aware of that. And, you know, it's proven true. I mean, I've always treated people right and done the right thing and hey, do what you say you're going to do. That's really mm -hmm. what it comes down to. How did you learn the note business? Because back in 07, it, I know it's a small mark to begin with, but back in 07, you had no gurus out there teaching. And now there's a lot more guys out there. So where did you, where did you get your education? Because you just can't go into a business like real estate, multifamily, fix and flipping without some type of knowledge. Where did you learn it? it, it um, um, for, fortunately and unfortunately, we were bootstrapping that and we learned mostly from the sellers of, of what to do. And then a lot of it was trial and error, uh, on, you know, and you you know, it's funny when I see people today, they're like, uh, I don't know that they're as resourceful. You know, they, they can't, a lot of people can't seem to figure it out. They want to hand it on a silver platter. Like, here's how you do it, you know, mm -hmm. but sometimes you don't have that to your point. And even second liens, if you, re, if you remember the history of junior liens and HELOCs, they weren't around that long. Mm -hmm. And we didn't have a big downturn where there was a big influx of distressed second mortgages, right? It never had occurred before. The banks didn't know what to do with that product. So there wasn't a guru to your point because it mm -hmm. never happened before. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you just got to know. It's like when an opportunity comes your way, are you ready to take advantage of it or not? And sometimes you just have to kind of step up and do it. Um, it would be, I'm trying to think of a good analogy to that. But, you know, today the biggest, big opportunity is the internet. The internet changed the note business dramatically. Um, you know, I can send someone out to a property for 40 bucks. I can't go down the street and look at a property for 40 bucks myself, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like, uh, you know, it's a different world now, right? You have so much more information online that there's no reason in the world all of us can't be successful in some kind of business with the internet. I always kid my kids about that. You know, I'm like, you guys have a huge advantage. <laughs> Uh, There's pros and cons to that, though. The bro, it, there is, there is, there is. Yep. I think the big pro to that is yes, you have it, but the con is knowledge without action is nothing. So, Correct. and the problem is it's the instant gratification. If you can't work through a problem and, and and struggle with that, which most people nowadays can't, they quit after two months of not working on it because you know Google is supposed to teach them everything, and you go on YouTube, watch a few videos. That that's really hard for the generation nowadays because they're used they're used to working through it and then everything looks so glamorous. You go on Instagram and you think everyone's life is wonderful except your own, right? And then you it's realize, TV. yeah, and you realize that everyone's life sucks to some degree, like yours does, and it's just yeah. like you got to figure it out, right? So there's definitely pros out there, but I mean, like when a product is not there, you guys are figuring it out that is pretty awesome. Well, there's too much information too, to your point, right? Mm -hmm. So there's so much information. How do we decipher it all, right? Mm -hmm. So, and, and that's where experts can come in and help people and networking, you know, mm -hmm. it's the, for me, I mean, that's what helped me a lot was it, it was just expanding my network, trying to be the dumbest guy in the room all the time. Mm -hmm. which that's I'm, not hard I'm, for me, bro. I'm pretty good. I'm pretty good at that. So. <laughs> that I'm, that's not hard for me. You said a couple of times the deals and financing. Can you go, you know, chunk that down and, and dive into that a little bit? Well, sure. I mean, a lot of times, um, even when I was buying houses on a regular basis, like today, I just don't have the time to do that as much, um, like especially the SFR world. Um, like I'll give you an example. Back in the day, I would, I would make multiple offers on the same property, right? So I would do, here's an all-cash offer. Here's an offer if you hold a second. Here's an offer if I take over subject to. Here's an offer if it's a lease option. Here's an offer you know, um, if it's all-cash that I bring in private money for. So I might... Not that I'm giving a, 
a seller 10 offers. I don't mean that, but I'd give mm -hmm. them two or three that would fit their scenario. And all, all three worked for me. And mm -hmm. I would get many a great deal from the financing. And I think that's what kind of started it. But the one thing I did notice is that with the one advantage of commercial real estate is you can get really, you can get as creative as you want. And, um, you know, I saw that with a lot of things. There's a lot of streams of income that we were able to access, even in the mobile home parks where it was, uh, we were doing everything from RV parking to financing a shed to financing, you know, a Florida room or a garage or, or skirting. And, and mm -hmm. it was all about lot rent. We would build everything in the lot rent because then we could go down to the bank mm -hmm. and pull money out of the value. We would play games with the cable company. We'd say, hey, it's free cable. And then six months later, raise the lot rent, right? So there's ways to up your game uh, as far as the cash flow. Uh, you know, and, and one of the reasons I was in the mobile home park space uh, was because uh, we ended up becoming our own bank. We would actually finance units too. But in the very beginning, w what I liked about it was depreciation was super accelerated. Uh, you didn't have as high a turnover because it's hard to move a unit out of there. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so it was depreciation. It was, uh, and you're leasing land, right? So you were able to uh, do some unique things with that type of property. Um, you know, you didn't have the turnover. You didn't have the maintenance either. They were maintaining their own units. Mm -hmm. You didn't have townships coming in, inspecting. And if they did, it was the actual mobile homeowner that paid that, right? Mm -hmm. So there were some advantages if you were in the, especially if you're in the right states, if you're in, uh, you know, owner or landlord friendly type areas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, this, this is a great question because I think a lot of guys out there are saying you put in multiple offers. I'm sure a lot of those offers were low. Uh, how did you, you know, cause guys are always, uh, go, he's always scared about insulting brokers. How did you reconcile that? Cause you're a broker yourself and you know, a lot of those offers are probably legit, but they're still a lot lower than what they're asking. I mean, how do you get around that? I know you're smiling cause it just <laughs> makes me laugh. Cause it's, you know, no offers low. I say, throw in yeah. your underwriting, send over your underwriting. And I mean, how do you reconcile that? How do you, how do you, you know? Well, there's an, what's the old saying? Uh, if you're not embarrassed by your offer, it's too high. Uh, <laughs> the, but the, um, you know, in the beginning, well, even as a realtor, because I was working with a lot of investors um, and I was always trying to find them properties, I would use LOIs, letter of intent. Mm -hmm. And I would literally go in and do searches of what's been on the market a long time, what's been listed with multiple realtors. I was always had unique ways of finding property. I'd look for administrators because they're nursing home deals. People don't know that. Uh, I'd be in there, you know, grinding through estates and of course the handyman's, but I would offer, I would shoot off a bunch of ridiculous offers on letters of intent to realtors, uh, throughout the area. And then a lot of realtors knew I would take on these problems. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And I would even try to do lease options on listings that didn't sell for realtors, mm -hmm. right? Like, Hey, you didn't get paid anything, but I'll pay you, you know, mm -hmm. like the old Wendy patent type strategy. So I would do all kinds of things like that. Um, to be that go-to resource to take out a property. But really, it was all about finding distressed property. And all the note business did was it accelerated it and made it huge quantities. Because now I can, you know, it was just like the, there's two note worlds too, right? There's the seller finance note world and there's the institutional. Well, the seller finance world is let's go send out letters and let's go down to the courthouse and all this stuff to hope to get a deal. Mm -hmm. I can call a trade desk and say, send me, I want a thousand assets. <laughs> you know, it's just mm -hmm. night and day, right? It's yeah. like, uh, so y you just kind of, I don't know. I just moved away from that and said, no, I'm, that's craziness. That's just too slow for me. Mm -hmm. There's two golden nuggets that I pulled out of the last 10 minutes. And I hope everyone's been paying attention. Number one, we need a motivated seller for a deal. And I, we teach that. And if it's not motivated, don't even waste your time on the writing the deal. I think. And number two, I think the the re, the way you present a couple of offers, you're trying to solve a problem. It's not not what you. It's not only in your best interest, but it's in your. You're trying to create a, a solution for the seller, and if you can do that, and you, I don't want to say win win, but if you can solve their problem, you're going to buy that property. That's what it comes down to. So if you can focus on the other side and listen to them, I mean, ask them why are you selling the property, what's going on. Oh, I'm getting divorced. I've got an opportunity. Uh, you know, I'm burned out. I'm retiring. Whatever it is, focus on that, and then create your offer based on that those two golden nuggets will ex will accelerate and explode re your real estate investing by tenfold at least i think it will 
No, you're dead on. I mean, in, in the note business, for example, which is very similar, the four main reasons we get a delinquent mortgage is death, divorce, job loss, and medical. Well, it kind of par parlays right into real estate too, mm -hmm. right? So it's like, if I'm, um, I don't know, I'm not necessarily in the multifamily space today mm -hmm. per se, although, yeah, if you bring me a deal, <laughs> I'll fund it. But mm -hmm. uh, no, but the, but the cool part there is I'm sure there's, you know, out of state earners, somebody getting divorced, somebody's sick, somebody's, uh, Actually, I had a buddy that used to do a lot of multifamily. He would search um, by age, elderly owners, you know? Mm. So, I mean, because at some point, they're, they're fat, their heirs might not want it. You know, we think our heirs want it. Some might, but they don't. They, sometimes they want the money. They don't, want right. the they don't want the headaches that, or they think dad was nuts for managing all that. Mm -hmm. So, I like that. yeah. I, I like that. Um, that. That's a great point. Debt, divorce. Say it again. Death, divorce, job loss, and medical are the four main reasons we get. I love that. That's great. Where do you go out and find investors uh, for your note fund? <laughs> the same place everybody else. Now, uh, <laughs> believe it or not, it started out kind of small with, um, you know, I would get a deal. Um, in fact, in the beginning, I didn't have a deal, right? So what do you do when you don't have a deal and you don't, you're not that good or you haven't done it yet? And what I did was I would tap into someone else's deal. I would shadow or mirror their deal or I would raise money for their deal or I would use their team. So a lot of times, even in the mobile home park business, I, the guys that I was raising money for had never done it before, but they put together an, an A, player, a player type team, right? So it's all about how do I build an, uh, you know, an, an A player type team on, yeah, and then I present that. So we would do like Q&A, uh, happy hours and all that stuff in the beginning, almost like you would do a meet up today or, you know, we would uh, just have a little meeting, demonstrate our deal and, and just say, do you know, and the other thing is I would ask people, do you know what, uh, do you know anyone that would be interested in this deal? I wouldn't even, you know, uh, go to them for it, even though I knew they might be high net worth or something. I'd say, hey, do you know anybody that's interested in a deal like this? Here's the tax advantages. Here's why the investors seem to like it. You, do you know anyone? And then the other time is uh, when some people would ask me what I do for a living, I'd say I raise private equity or I raise capital for a living. And then people would go, Oh, what's that? Right. And we create those kinds of, you know, have your ele have multiple elevator pitches ready, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, when people ask you what you do. So it depends on my audience. You know, I might say, Hey, I'm a, you know, I manage several mortgage investment funds today, but you, you know, I, it, but if I'm talking to five-year-olds, I'm not going to say that. I'm going to, so be aware of your audience as well mm -hmm. as to your pitch. But I think when people know, if, if I say I do delinquent upside down second mortgages and bankruptcy with no equity, Josh might look at me funny or Jake <laughs> might say, you guys are nuts. I'm not giving you a dime. Uh, but if you show a pattern and a history and how you're profitable and you show case studies, Hey, here's a deal we did. Or here's a, he, here's the guy I'm working with today. And here's a deal he just did, you know, so you can start to tell the story of why, you know, I should, well, it's really, how do you make the investors feel comfortable and confident to give you capital? And um, in the very beginning, I always thought it was about expanding my network. And in fact, I would build, I would hit everybody in my network and then you run out of people, right? And then I actually would go to other trusted friends and tap into their network. So I'll give you an example. I was running a fund out of San Diego. I'm in Philadelphia and I was running a fund out of Dallas with all physicians and dentists and chiropractors and things like that. So I would run funds in other areas and with different marketing and tap into someone else's network. So that's a strategy. Mm -hmm. But today I think the best strategy is doing things like what I'm doing today, podcast where it's who knows you. So it's kind of, um, Hey, I know that guy, he's got a good track record. Um, so it, it, it's not so much today. It's not about who I know. It's more about who knows me. Mm -hmm. And that's the, probably the ultimate area of, to raise capital because now you're, you can actually turn it on and turn it off and you have to be good at regulating capital too. A lot of people don't talk about that. You know, so. mm -hmm. That's another, another golden nugget guys. Uh, we're talking about inbound marketing, which with the internet completely changed because now you can start a business. Now Dave's not talking about a little bit of work. He's talking about a lot of work. He's written probably hundreds of articles. He's written books. He's done probably hundreds of podcasts. He goes on bigger pockets every week and shares his knowledge. But at the end of the day, it's costing him time, maybe a little bit of money, but he's becoming the expert. He's positioning himself as an expert. He's packaging his stuff 
and he's promoting his stuff and everyone's coming back and reaching back out to him. And I, that is the best because when you, a prospect raises their hands and reaches out to you, you got them. And then from that one referral, all of a sudden you get a bunch of other referrals. So he's laying out the path on how to raise capital, learn the space, start giving out. It's the go giver mentality. It's give to get right. You're giving a lot of information. You're giving a lot of value and in return, you're going to get a lot back. So, um, well done. I like that strategy. Works, works well for us too. Right. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's about being the thought leader. Mm -hmm. Uh, the teacher's the best student, right? So (laughs) uh, if you help other people, you know, succeed, you, you'll succeed, right? I mean, mm-hmm. it, it's that was it, Zig Ziglar. Help everybody get what they want, you'll get what you want. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I kind of believe in that. I agree. So, what are the advantages for investors with with a note fund like yours? I think the biggest advantage is they don't have to know how to do, you know, uh, collections or know all the compliance. And the advantage of a fund investor is it's very passive. It's pretty much mailbox money. And they also get diversification and they have limited liability. I mean, mm-hmm. that's how I look at it because I'm a fund investor. Uh, so that's a big advantage, uh, mm-hmm. you know, and you don't have tenants and toilets and, and all the other good stuff that goes along with it. And that, that's one of the things I liked about commercial multifamily, right? If I'm buying more than a hundred units or more, uh, especially I don't have, I can have on-site management and maintenance. Now there's nothing wrong with smaller places. I, I own a few, you know, quite a few of those. Uh, mm-hmm. But I have management too. And the hardest hire for me as a former property manager was hiring a property manager, right? It's just like, uh, you know, what, if you're the plumber, the hardest person to hire is the plumber, right? So, mm-hmm. yeah. Well, it's tough with property management because you need to pay them well. And sometimes you can't pay them well because they're the face. The first person that when you walk into the office, they've got to get up off the chair, say, good morning. How you doing? And it's hard to do that because they are the, they are the face of your brand. People don't understand that. So you know, multifamily, you can scale up and start paying them more money, and based on compensation and all, that's one of the that's one of the I guess things that people you know try to pay them twelve or fifteen bucks an hour. That's not a twelve dollar yeah. an hour job, correct? I mean, you really got to. Yeah. It's not the place to skimp out. Nope. Um, I take care of my property manager for sure. Mm-hmm. I, the other thing is, I've known her for over thirty years, and she's a. Um, she's a local judge, like a district justice. So, mm-hmm. you know, you never lose in court. <laughs> but the, uh, you get the idea. I love that. So what are some unique strategies that you as a fund manager have employed successfully to grow your fund? Um, to grow my fund? Probably the biggest thing is, um, well, capital has changed our world, right? So mm-hmm. we're, like now we buy mostly first mortgages. So the biggest strategy shift for us is, uh, you know, we started out as a junior lien shop, which took less capital. It was less capital, but more upside and more risk, right? Mm-hmm. Today, we're, we have so much capital that we, I guess, probably two thirds or three quarters of what we purchased last year were all first mortgages. So we've shifted into first mortgages. Um, and you never know where, where that could lead. It could, uh, our next fund can do commercial notes now. So who knows? We might be giving you guys a note. Um, and uh-huh. the other neat thing that shifted for us is the way we raise capital. I mean, we've had high rates and low rates, depending on the market, whether we're in an up or down market. So we've lived through a couple cycles. Uh, but the cool part I have coming up now is I have a liquidity fund that's uh, launching in September. And what's unique about that is it's a lower preferred return. But the cool part is you can have your capital back in 90 days notice and you're mm-hmm. backed by first mortgages. So say you are an apartment guy. Well, what are you making on your capital while you're waiting to buy the next building? And the answer is not much. Yeah. <laughs> Usually. You That's know. right. So That's I, we, we've kind of entered a market where we think we can add value to folks like, uh, you know, you know, folks on the call or. Yeah. So that's great. Another golden nugget guys. Just see what the market needs. Cause right now there's people that have money and funds that aren't making any money. So Dave recognizes that there's something in the market that is lacking. That's great. That is, that's an awesome fun. I like that. That's a great idea. Um, let me ask you what, what you think there are any similarities or differences between your note fund and a syndication for commercial real estate? Actually not much from the securities perspective. Um, it's very similar to, you know, you're pulling capital to go buy real estate backed assets. Mm -hmm. Uh, you guys have a lot more tax advantages, uh, but sometimes your term might be longer. Mm -hmm. So my typical fund is a three year fund. And our, our minimums are lower, but we only deal with high net worth because if you're not accredited investor, you can always buy a note. So it's not like you can't get in the game. 
you just wouldn't be able to get in a note in our note fund. Some note funds might accept it or crowdfunding might accept it. Mm -hmm. uh, but so our funds are very different. Now I actually run a, uh, what do you call it? I run a group called strategic investor Alliance, which is a side thing I do. And some of it's for selfish reasons, but some of it's for other like-minded high net worth investors because I can't always give them what they need. So there's people that come there with all kinds of alternative investments and all, and we share resources for experts too. So the cool part about the group is, Hey, I want to invest in apartments too. I want to invest in other stuff too. I don't want to just invest in notes because a note fund won't have tax advantages normally, unless I'm coming out of a uh, qualified plan. Mm -hmm. But, but the beauty of an apartment fund or a storage center fund is that it gives me the ability to get some tax advantages and that might be longer term and it might be a larger initial investment. Mm -hmm. Whereas you see my no fund is a lower initial investment, but it's a shorter term, you know, and then you might see a hard money fund or a tax lien fund with different time frames. But I always like these real estate backed assets. Um, and really it's as simple as if I can buy something at a discount with a high yield with collateral, I feel I can beat the market. Mm -hmm. And that's just, you're talking to a guy who traded options. So I, you know, I just believe that that's a great way to go for me. I love that. Uh, let me ask you, if I'm a new guy, what are your, what are your, is your framework, your steps for me to get into the note business? What should I start doing? It's almost the same thing for anything. You could be, I don't care if you learn how to play guitar. I mean, anything, it's really about getting educated in the space, uh, networking with folks, doing it. And if you can find some type of mentor, coach, JV partner, somebody to shadow. Nobody says you have to invest a lot of money, mm -hmm. right? Like I can always tap into someone else's knowledge. And I think that combination is a better, you know, path to success. You know what I mean? Rather than mm -hmm. trying to go, oh, let me go bootstrap it and figure everything out on my own. And I did that. I mean, the first, gosh, I was probably close to 40 before I started really networking with other real estate. Like I was the realtor that an investor who did everything as a loaner. Mm -hmm. And looking back, I was a caveman. I should have been networking a lot sooner. And really what drove me to that was I ran out of financing. I couldn't get capital. So I joined the local real estate meeting, you know, and one thing led to another. But then I realized there was a lot I didn't know. You know, I was kind of like, I thought I was a know-it-all. And then I realized, no, I don't know anything. <laughs> you know? We have a term for that here on Jake and Gino. It's called the dig jam, guys. The word of the day for the week is, damn, I'm good. Just ask me, right? Yeah. We've, all, we've all been that, right? We've all been there. So, and I keep hammering people because there's so much to know. I've been doing the podcast for three years and every podcast, I learn something new. So when you're out there, you think you know it all. Um, and that's, that's one of the reasons why I think everyone should form a meetup. If you're serious about it, the meetup is not free to raise money. The meetup is for you to meet people and actually to learn stuff because you'd be, you'd be amazed at the different collection of people there, whether you have a mortgage banker, a broker, a realtor, a construction guy, you can create your own team out of that meetup and you'll learn so much more. So um, I think that, I think that's awesome. I think that's really cool. You know, you, you are so right about that. I, I started a group years ago. It started out as me, the realtor. I had an accountant, an IRA custodian, an attorney, a couple people. Right. And we mm -hmm. shared our networks. The first meeting was 12 people in center city. And next thing you know, in a five year period, we were in five States, six cities from Baltimore to New York. And, ha and we had over 8,000 people in our database. Dude, that's awesome. So that's, that shows you the power of how fast the network could really grow. And then and I, never, now, I, I never started out raising capital. I started, I, I started the group in hopes of selling a couple more houses. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and with that knowledge today, you can go on Facebook Live. You can, you can video content that and put that on your, on your website, make a YouTube channel out of it. You can repurpose all that content and show yourself that you've got an 8,000 person group. Do you think people can want to invest with you? That's what the inbound marketing is talking about. But it doesn't happen overnight. It might take a couple of meetings where you're at a coffee shop with three or four friends and hanging out and maybe, you know, hooking up with Dave Van Horn or, or Jake and Gino saying, hey, listen, can you do a Zoom call with us? Just 20 minutes, we're at a coffee shop. Next month, same thing all of a sudden it'll start growing but there has to have a vision it has to be a purpose for you to do this stuff and i think man eight thousand people that is awesome that's a great way to build it's a great way to build a network correct 
I, in the beginning, we started paying for lunch and then it got so big. We're like, we can't afford to pay for this. <laughs> and then it got to, we were doing dinners, you know, and then we were uh -huh. like, and then it was a couple hundred people every time. And then That's we were like, awesome. ah, this is ridiculous. We got to charge to get in. <laughs> That's great. Exactly. Now you start monetizing, my friend. You see that? That's awesome. That's a good problem to have. Um, last long answer question. Um, what is your best uh, real estate note tip to the listeners? I, I think it's really, um, we're all on the hunt for leverage. So it's all about leverage. What can you leverage in the next six to 12 months that are, it's going to catapult your world, catapult your business, catapult you personally. What is that type of thing? And I think a lot of it is, I like for the a lot of real estate folks is the concept of being the bank, but the deals often in the financing. And it's also using the right leverage at the right times too. So I think some of it's timing. And mm -hmm. I think, uh, if folks, uh, looked at their financing and maximized their, uh, their leverage, they might not need to own as many units or have as many headaches, so to speak. You could be more efficient with what you're doing and build wealth exponentially. Mm -hmm. And um, I see that with people that don't maximize, you know, some of their assets, some of their equity, some of the, things like that. Um, and then also be aware of your asset protection, your liquidity, those types of things, your reserves. So I think it's really about really understanding all of that and you're, you're bound to be a lot more successful if you consider all those types of things. I love that. I was just listening to T. Harv Eker yesterday and he was talking about leverage. People want to lever other people. If you are not leveraging yourself and having maximum energy, if you're not at least a level 10 yourself, leverage is not going to work, right? So you have to be engaged. You have to be motivated. You have to be inspired. You have to know what you're doing to be able to leverage other stuff. So I totally, I totally agree with your, with your, uh, with your recap of that. Yeah. I mean, when I was young, I first got married, my wife was working, I was working two jobs. We were like ships passing in the night. I'm watching the kids. She's going to work. And looking back, that was insane. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> Cause we weren't leveraging anything. So you, you have to find a way to leverage something, technology, capital, people, whatever that is, mm -hmm. real estate, it's all about leverage. That's really the true way to wealth. We're not going to do it alone. Nobody, nobody became super successful by themselves. Right? Mm -hmm. I love that. I agree. A lot of people say OPM, right? Other people's money. I say OPE, leverage other people's everything. Right? Why reinvent the wheel? <laughs> yeah, I like that. I like that. So, all right, we're going to go bigger picture than that. What about your best habit for success? You've been in the game 30 years. One, one tip, if you had to distill it down. I still think it's uh, connecting and never stop learning. You know, when I first got out of college, I was back to that know-it-all mentality. I mean, I didn't even read much. Today, I'm reading like five books at a time. And I think really, the, it's like Charlie Tremendous Jones says, the, the only difference between, not the only difference, but the big difference between where you are today and where you are a year from today is the books you read and the people you meet. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. I do too. I like that. What about, so, okay. When you mentioned when you first got in the game, you took massive action, you learned sort of from the school of hard knocks. What was the biggest mistake you made looking back? It was definitely the, uh, the control piece. The only time I ever lost money was when I invested capital and, get, and didn't have control. So there were times where I invested in a project and I didn't really have control. Uh, some of them were land development deals. Some of them were due to the market. Some were due to bad management, you know, but I, what I learned was I want to be, I can lose the money myself, right? I don't need anybody else to do it for me. Mm -hmm. so, so I'd rather be in control because then you can step in and do things. Whereas if you're not in control, you can't. So be aware of that whenever you're investing, you know? So this is another thing that you keep throwing golden nuggets at me. I want to make sure people are listening to this because it's important. Dave's talking about sponsors. Whenever you get into a deal, make sure you vet the sponsor and you can have, I guess you, your control of the sponsor. Does the sponsor have you know, credibility? Has he done it before? A marginal deal with a great sponsor is better than a great deal with the marginal sponsor. So make sure you vet that sponsor out because when things go south, the sponsor will be there. So, I mean, I don't want to put words into your own mouth, but do you agree with that? Or yeah. No, a hundred percent. Now I don't want you to think that I never invest passively. I do, but it, but I have a lot more capital or I'm mm -hmm. prepared to lose it or I'm just being more diversified, but I am betting the deal. I'm betting the, I'm betting the person, especially mm -hmm. I actually use a company uh, called Prescient. They help me. They'll do backgrounds on pe people or companies. 
and they do very detailed reports for not modest fees. Uh, so it's very, there's no reason if I'm going to invest a million bucks with somebody or half a million dollars with somebody, I just want to know who they are and what they've mm -hmm. been up to. And uh, we don't always know. Right. And I've been in some of those situations too. So over time you, you kind of learn those lessons and, and you, uh, it's really, I just want to do business with good people. That's really what yes. it comes down to. So. Yes. Get that on the front end because hopefully everyone makes that mistake earlier on in their careers. I know I did a couple of deals I did earlier on. The sponsor was just not, wasn't a good sponsor. And the deal was good. And the first couple of years it was okay. But as soon as the deal went south, the sponsor was terrible. So um, that's a great tip. Go do your background checks. Make sure you, you know who you're investing with. And I, probably the last thing I would say is, is, is about the culture and the team you're trying to build. You want to build, it's not about, I, I look at like the NFL. I heard this guy speak the other day and he said the best NFL teams, their goal is not to win the Super Bowl. Their goal is, their goal is to build the best team with the best players. And that makes a lot of sense to me. So you don't have to have this pie in the sky, knock it out of the universe. Goalness, I mean, goals are good. Don't take mm -hmm. it the wrong way. But if you have, if you're doing the right basics, if you have the good team and you put a good team together and you're all doing the right things and you're all moving in the right direction, I think the Super Bowl will come. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's a little okay. different way yeah. to look at it. I, I agree on that one a lot. You know, having the right people around you and taking the right actions, all of a sudden winning becomes a, a byproduct of doing that. Right? Those people are going to push you and really that, that should be the focus because I agree that's what's going to get you there. Now, a minute ago, you mentioned, you know, reading books. What is your favorite book and why? Wow. I, I read a lot of books, probably at least 25 a year, which isn't the most. I had a buddy the other day tell me he reads 50 books a year. I'm like, dude, that's a lot. He yeah. gets up 4.30 in the morning. Uh, but the, uh, yeah, I don't read that much. But the, uh, my favorite one lately has been Abundance by, uh, I think it's Peter Diamandis. And the reason I like it is, I mean, I know it's not a, technically a real estate book, but what I like about it is the mindset and the positive attitude and the optimism about our future and about all the solutions to almost all the world's problems are all right in front of us. We just need to connect all the dots. Well, and, he's, he's amazing. It's an it's amazing, amazing book, book, right? Yeah, it's an amazing book. I, I recommend yeah. it to anybody. It'll yeah. definitely give you a positive outlook. You know how a lot of times you're around some negative folks and they're like, oh, you know, the world's going to end and everything's terrible. And you read abundance and you're like, you know what? We're really lucky people. We have a lot of stuff at our disposal here, you know? So I love that. I mean, he's talking about 3d printing. It's like, you can print. I mean, it's just amazing. The stuff that, and it's unfortunate because that doesn't get any press, right? I mean, we're sent, we're, I mean, the space missions, what Elon Musk is doing, we're on the cusp of so many things. And if you read that book, what you, what you learn as an entrepreneur is maybe you should be the first guy in the space because you'll get slaughtered. Maybe you're the second or third guy, right? You should be the, the you should always look at uh, businesses that are disrupting the spaces and you'll see what's going on. And then you'll see what's going on with the political climate. When you see disruption happening, the, the powers that be are going to be, get really annoyed. So it opens up your mind to see what's going on and, and have it really logically. And like I, I say to you, there's so many wonderful things going on in this world. There's a lot of bad things going on, but there's so many more wonderful things that are going on. And the ability to, I don't know, to just like explode what's going on around us and the solutions that we have are really unbelievable. It's a great book. I, he's a smart dude. He's way, I'm just, he's way above my yeah. level. Sometimes I, I get lost in the weeds and I'm like, what's he talking about? And then I got to reel it back in, but uh, I'm glad you mentioned that book. That's an awesome book. Thank you. All right. Last question. So what projects do you have on the horizon right now that you're excited about? Well, one I mentioned, which is the liquidity fund. Um, you know, that whole concept because, because I'm positioning myself into something that banking doesn't do. Disruption. Right. right. And I have, I have a, a real close friend that does commercial notes for small businesses, right. And banks, and he was a former bank president. He's retired now. And he starts this company that does commercial notes for small businesses. And this guy gets it. He was, like I said, he merged banks, he bought banks, he sold banks. And he's like, this product doesn't exist. Banks won't touch this. So I like finding those types of niches uh, where a bank won't a bank won't offer financing for a rehab project on an SFR, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it, one, you know, someday maybe I'll be the hard money lender for a uh, multifamily. You, you know, there's things that are missing out there, guys, right? Like mm -hmm. there's places to step in uh, where banks won't really play, 
that are perfectly fine. I mean, what would be the problem if I gave Gino a hard money deal to renovate an apartment complex with a draw schedule and I saw his history and I trusted Gino? And a lot of banks might say no to that, right? So mm -hmm. there's, there's, there's opportunity everywhere we look. But I think um, that's a big one for us. I mean, really, we're, we're trying to become a billion dollar fund someday. So we have some uh, pretty asp aspirational goals and we do help a lot of people. So the beauty of our business is uh, socially impactful investing. So it's, um, you know, we, we do a lot to try to keep homeowners in their homes and modify stuff. And then we also do a lot to try to get the boarded up REO off the street next door mm -hmm. to you, right? Who wants to live in a million dollar neighborhood with a board up next to them? Mm -hmm. So our, our, our goal is to, you know, help, um, you know, the, the socially impactful type of investing, socially conscious stuff. And, um, and we do it through our charities and our events and things like that. So I think it's a, there's a way to do business. Um, you know, one of my best real estate deals was a house I used to live in. It's a six bedroom, three bath house that today is a drug and alcohol recovery center, right? So you can yeah. do rental real estate in a more impactful way. Um, my buddy has a 40 unit apartment complex that is to uh, disabled vets. So just think about how can I do my everyday business in a unique way to benefit a little bit more than just, you know, cash flow or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's it. a cool concept too. If you get to a point where you're able to do that and hopefully, uh, you know, a lot of your, your fans and followers will be there someday quick enough, you know, they're doing well and they can do a little bit extra that doesn't really, you know, it doesn't hurt you. Right. It, it, you're able to help more people in the, mm -hmm. on the, on the way, you know, Dave, how can uh, listeners get a hold of you? They can't. No, well, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just um, well I, I mean, a lot of it's through bigger, you know, if you go to biggerpockets.com forward slash users forward slash Dave Van Horn, I, I answer people all the time in the forums. Uh, I, like you said, I wrote a book, recently did a book with them called Real Estate Note Investing. Uh, if you go to biggerpockets.com forward slash note investing, people can pick that up. And it's a good general overview of the note business. Um, but also on LinkedIn, you can go to LinkedIn, catch mm -hmm. me on Dave Van Horn. Uh, we do have a website, pprnoteco.com, pprnoteco.com. If someone you know is interested in, in note funds and that type of thing. Uh, but I really appreciate you guys uh, having me on today. Thank you. Um, any recap, Mr. Rusin? Yeah, so I got a few of them here. One, if you look at what there's a need in the market for and fill that with a solution, that's how it seems like Dave was able to innovate and continue to grow his businesses. Also the power of leverage, being able to leverage, like we said, not only other people's money, but other people's knowledge, other people's everything will really speed up the progress that we're able to get where you want to go. Networking, that's something that even though you may not have the results you want yet, if you get in front of that and network, you'll make those connections that'll allow you to get there much quicker. Again, leverage. Um, and then I would say massive action. When it comes down to it to really get started, you can have all the knowledge in the world. But if you're not implementing it and you got, you don't have to be great to get started. You have to get started to be great. Right. So that would be the uh, golden nuggets I took away. Do you know what I miss anything there? I think just don't worry about what everyone else is doing. Shut off your Instagram because everyone else's life sucks like yours sometimes. And it's tough out there and it's okay to struggle because that's how we learn. Get out of your comfort zone and, and, and I think push yourself and realize that you're going to fail. People go to college for four years to get a job. Take the next 12 months of your life, read 25 books on a subject you like, and I will guarantee you, you will know more in that subject than 95% of the people. And then it's just analysis paralysis. You need to pull the trigger like Josh says. And it's okay if you fail the first time. It's okay if you fail the second time. Just keep trying and you will figure it out. And then when you do figure it out, it's like, wow, it wasn't that bad. And then financial freedom has allowed Dave to really prosper and actually have all these, all these wonderful things happen to his life because he's not worrying about paying the mortgage. He's worrying about something grander. He's worrying about a billion dollar fund. He's worrying about helping out vets, right? I mean, that's what it is. When you're, when you're struggling and paying the bills, you can't do that. You can't write a book to help people about notes. I'm going to pick up the book right now and we get off the call because I just want to learn about notes. I, I'm, it's really, um, you know, something foreign to me. I haven't done, I've been immersed in multifamily the last five years, but I can take a couple hours out of the day and read that book. So I want everyone when they off the call Get the book, start reading about it because it might be something in there that might spark your interest or might give you another tool in the toolbox. So get out there, um, read it. And I just want to thank Dave for being on the show. It was an awesome show. Um, 
I got, I got one more. So it's Dave also said a couple times over, it's not a lack of resources. A lot of times it's a lack of resourcefulness, right? As long as you're solution oriented, there's ways to get over the hurdles. You just got to think outside the box sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like Tony Robbins, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, Dave, thanks a lot for being on the show. We appreciate it and good luck in the future. Yeah. Thank you guys. It was great.